get ready for something amazing this week on History Seekers. All right, guys, so we're out here in Mumford. They are going to be having a funeral tomorrow, and they've got a lot of reenactors here. So we're going to be talking to some of them, hopefully gain some insight on how things were back in the time and how they do things to try to make them as historically accurate as possible. Let's go over there and talk to them real quick. And there's a lot of people from around uh, the U.S. that don't know a lot about the Civil War and, and don't know a lot about the uniforms and that sort of thing and the way the soldiers lived. And we're going to see if you guys could kind of help us out and, and tell everybody a little bit about it. Why did you choose the particular regiment that you have chosen, the 48th Alabama? It's where I'm from. 48th Alabama uh, formed up at Gunnersville, uh, was sent to Auburn, Alabama, and were trained and shipped to Virginia under Longstreet's Corps. So we portray a lot of, a lot of the Virginia uh, personnel uh, don't get that much of an opportunity to go into Virginia, but we do get the opportunity with the 48th since they were sent back to Chickamauga and have that opportunity when we do get the Chickamaugas to come around, we get that opportunity to really be uh, the 48th Alabama. Uh, the rest of the reenactments we do, most of the time we're portraying Army of Tennessee. Army of Tennessee, yes. so we, we don't dress up as the Virginian troops. And then we have a Union persona. We do both sides. Six Kentucky. Think six Kentucky U.S., yes. which, of course, was a regiment outside of Louisville. And they, they, I guess we chose a Kentucky regiment so that our southern accents wouldn't give us away. <laughs> but there were a lot of Unionists in Kentucky and Tennessee. Sure. Absolutely. Do you sure. see a difference how you're portrayed between if you uh, portray a Union side versus a Confederate side? Depends on where the reenactment is. Yeah, it depends it, on the reenactment. Go to Aiken, uh, South Carolina, and they ask why you're there. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm a traitor to Alabama, even though I live in Alabama. I'm with 34th Georgia. Yeah. And after I took time to study my genealogy, is that how you say Yeah, it? yeah. My great great grandfather's traced back to the 48th Georgia Company A, so I'm not so much a traitor to, <laughs> as they feel like. Uh, you was one of them come on when the King of England sent all the tax evaders over to settle Georgia then, huh? I reckon so. <laughs> as you guys can see, these guys are also students of history as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your coat here and how do you make sure that things are, are period accurate and, and that sort of thing. And I, I know you probably, you guys probably have to get some. Oh yeah, main thing, the tailors that you use. I mean, each of us that's really trying to portray the clothing history. And I wish Caleb was here right now yeah. because he is the history buff on clothing. But I mean, you get an idea on this captain's coat, it's got the uh, padding in it, which made the officer honestly look more broad shoulder when he was on the field. If you can see the padding on it, they had the tail pockets that they could pack stuff in that actually runs all the way down in the officer's coats. Uh, this one, of course, the cat guts on it would have been double because it is a captain's jacket. Lieutenant, lieutenant would have been single cat guts. So, uh, and I've got some of those type jackets too as I've come through the ranks over the years. So, uh, mainly uh, studying the clothing throughout, throughout history. Uh, in the south basically had a hard time in the deep south getting the Virginia grays. Uh, most of the things were walnut or tea dyed or that's why you get the butternut color. Uh, this would have been more of Virginia jacket. Uh, you know some of the wealthy officers had the opportunity to get a hold of that material. Uh, anything else y'all want to add? No, it pretty much covers it and listed. We do more Army of the Tennessee, which I'd have to go walk all over and get my all butter. I have to go get my uh, jacket if you want. Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, recently, in one in one of our videos, we found a shoulder scale. Yeah. Uh, that seen and, that. And, and there was some debate whether or not officers or enlisted men wore those, and, and some Ooh. people said that they may have been from a cannon crew that we think was nearby. Possibly, but he would have been an officer if he had a shoulder board. Okay. <laughs> If he had a shoulder board, he would have been an officer. Uh, most privates, uh, especially in the Confederate Army, 
you wouldn't have seen a lot of in, in the Federal Army, you would have seen the insignia on the shoulders more. Uh, you can talk about the yellow dog. Oh, yeah. That's if you it. look, if, if you look, uh, most of the Confederate stuff was on the collar, mm -hmm. not on the shoulders. Uh, officers would be shoulder boards in the, in, in the Union Army. Uh, get to talking about. That's more what the Army of Tennessee would be. That would have been the Army <laughs> of Tennessee. Uh, this is actually a Columbus Depot uh, that would have been issued uh, at, the, at this time. This is uh, actually, Kayla, make this one for you. I don't know who made it. Let's uh, see the I'll real quick, too. They're just the I empty right. tree. Yeah. I don't know who made it. Uh, I've got several jackets up there, different jackets. Uh, uh, by the time 1865 gets around, you would have had more of your Deep South jackets, Columbus Depots, Mobile, Arsenal. Uh, you would have had Atlanta Arsenal that would have yeah. been issued pretty heavily in the South. Uh, get the one made at home and sent to them. Yeah, a lot of them by right. that time were made at home. You would have seen a lot of some civilian jackets. I tell you, from from metal detecting some of the camps and stuff, and, and then from what we know about when uh, Lieutenant Buttram was was exhumed, uh, that sometimes they had a mix of buttons. By that, by late in the war, they were using whatever they, they, they could did. get their hands on, whether it be uh, Union yeah. buttons or flat buttons or, or whatever. Um, that's that's very interesting. Anything else you think of, Kel? You want to talk about any of the weapons? So, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the weapons and uh, try to relate it to some of the stuff that we find metal detecting and give you guys kind of a closer look at some of that. Basically, a lot of the Federals would have been Remingtons, but now that's how it would be a coat. Mm -hmm. This would have been a... would be a coat. Uh... This one's actually a 44. Okay. Uh, you would have had uh, some uh, 36s right. at that time also. Uh, I've actually got a 36 Remington, Remington when I portray uh, a union officer. Uh, captain would have been carrying a sword. Uh, this was a Confederate sword, as you can see. It is a Confederate issue sword, foot officers. Uh, you would actually uh, see the cavalry sword would have had more of a bend to it than what the foot officer sword would have had. Uh, of course, uh, the canteen was probably one of the most important things. Uh, this is a Confederate issue canteen. And most of the time it was a cork, but a good friend of mine whittled me a cedar cork. Oh, okay. So uh, I kind of cherish it. He's a good friend that fights with us. Uh, haversack, that have carried the food in the haversack, would have been issued three days rations. Most of the time because the uh, commissary and the wagon train was usually three days behind. Yeah. Uh, as, as the troops advanced, and they could cover a lot of ground, more ground than I can today in, in history. I mean... And now, were these kind of pretty much the most of the buckles used, or they just pretty much used whatever the they had? Bu roller buckles was, was issued quite a bit. And we, we find those quite a bit, yeah. as you guys will see on our channel from time to time when metal detecting. They'll have the little roller there on them. Roller buckles would have been issued quite a bit. We also find some, uh, these are the sword hangers. Yes. Uh, guys, and we've you've seen us find these on the channel before. And usually they're missing, for whatever reason, missing this part right here. First to rest. The <laughs> uh, they, they have, that's the first to go. And then what we find is this part here. And right. a lot of you have asked in the past how these connected to the sword, and now and now you see it, or the saber, it actually attached to the scabbard right here. Yes. And, and there it is attached. You'll find these hooks too, I'm sure. <laughs> the hook that was on the officer's belt. Yep, we find those occasionally too. I've never found, or at least one that I knew of, that wasn't mm. just straightened out or bent. Right, right. Yep, right. Very interesting. Thanks Joe has got his uh, infill. That's a reproduction of a 1853 infill that would have been imported from England, 58 caliber. Uh, 
Well, they used to have probably one of the two biggest side of the mountain down close yeah, to it's Springfield and Enfield. Uh, yeah, life our nose is very interesting, guys. Uh, it is an antique weapon, but uh, I can assure you when you're dealing with something that weighs 700 grains coming out of this gun right here, it destroys whatever it hits. Oh, yeah. Gangreen didn't have time to set up when that weapon was used. It actually done the kind of damage it was irreparable. That's where there was so many. about an ounce of lead. Oh, yeah. It's, it's amazing to fire the weapon live. That's the reason there's so many amputations. Oh, sure. When it hit the bone, it just shattered it. Right. And there was nothing to nothing to save. All they could do was amputate. And he was gut shot or anything. Oh, yeah, it was over. It was, it was tough. Pretty well over. Noticing how the, the infields always have the brass caps, and the spring fields had, a, had like a uh, steel or a, a steel cap. So... When we find those, a lot of the times the infield is, of course, it's turned green by the time we dig them up. Uh, but those are usually what's left. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Joe, show them the cap down there. I know she got a spent one down there. Oh, yeah. So use percussion cap. So they put powder in it. Typically, a mini ball would go down. Percussion it actually cap. made a decent round. How about that? Tied off and everything using That's it. stuff yep. on the front. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, holy moly. Powder, ball, take the ramrod out, pack it down in there. Percussion cap goes on. She's ready to go. Is that one they should be able to shoot three times in a minute? Supposedly. I've tried it. I'm not that good. Yeah, a, a skilled <laughs> soldier could get three off in a minute. That's uh, impressive. It, it is. That it is impressive. impressive. Yeah. Especially when your life's on the line. I don't know. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's amazing. But the, the distance on these are, are something else. Uh, what, 800, not even 1,000 yards, they'll go that distance. Uh, yeah, they'll go that distance. But, yeah. And... Uh, Kelly, we found some stuff uh, around that looks like some of the stuff like the cartridge box there, that like the finial I noticed on the bottom when he opened it up, and you guys have also seen that on the channel here before. Uh, sometimes we'll see those finials. Now sometimes those finials, especially if they're more pointed, would have been to a bayonet scabbard. Uh, do you guys have a bayonet scabbard right now? Uh, yeah. One of the problems. Yeah, like me. Yeah. yeah, no, I had actually tried. That's why I pulled out things. That's I had made some rounds that look a little more authentic, right. using a paper wadding oh, wow. rather than rather than um, a bullet. Obviously, could we get a look down? Because a lot of people never get to see. This is what the inside of a cartridge box would have looked like that these soldiers are carrying. Pulling your tins out. Very neat, and they just held pre-packaged so they didn't have to weigh out their powder. They just dump it in. And you would put, you would get them, but they'd actually be packs of 10 that you would put in here. And you'd okay. pull it out and tear the pack apart and then put the rounds in. Very, very. I didn't have, I didn't have an extra pack that I had made. Ugh. Too much work. <laughs> All right, and uh, one of the other reenactors is here. He's got a bayonet scabbard. Man, that thing looks. Seen quite a bit of use, hadn't it? I, I was going to say, it almost looks <laughs> yeah. like it got left over. You, it looks good. He just came right from the past. <laughs> I know. You just stepped right out of the past. You need to clean. Here. I've been at this quite a get, long time. We may have to get your corporal after you. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he should refurbish me with my equipment. But, but, well, that's but a commissary is, officer. But this is uh, what they're, uh, especially the Confederates, their stuff would be wearing out by the end of the war. That's That looks realistic. Look at this, guys. See, we talk about this on the channel a lot, how the bayonet slid and the leather is always rotted away. And this is the part that we find right here. The only part that's going to be left of it. Right. Occasionally, Maybe we'll these. find these rivets. Um, and but then, of course, somebody that, finds that a That is also one of the most deadliest weapons of the war right there. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You see its triangular shape. <laughs> that right there would ensue a wound in you that they could not sew up. Right. At the time, and if I was to run you through with this, especially ah. on the end of that. You, no, you know what it, you use these bayonets the most for. Pick you your put nose? your no, you put your meat on it and stick it in the fire. That's right. When I run you through with that, that makes a good candle out, holder. It yeah. would uh, create a suction that would cause an infection. 
so bad. It would uh, take a few days, but you would eventually die from it. Yeah. That, might, that would just make somebody mad. We had uh, <laughs> we had talked to a lot of people, and of course there's, there's different people with different takes on it. A lot of people think that, at least some of the soldiers, just being farm boys and not being hardened soldiers, actually... A lot of them were just bored. Right. They just wanted to leave the house because they were bored. Yeah, but a lot of them were, were kind of scared to, they didn't want to stick somebody. They, they didn't mind shooting their gun, but it was kind of taboo. The, the percentage of stab wounds yeah, it was, was about low. 2%, I think, if you read history. And so, right. so it was very rare. I mean, understand, most of these guys, when they met the enemy, not like a reenactment. Well, I mean, we're trying to get where the crowd can see it, but I mean, right. they're... 800 to 300 yards apart right and this war went uh, in the trenches quick I mean it really did uh, the, the accuracy of the rifling and the weapons improved and uh, they became more accurate so you started seeing uh, most soldiers taking cover yeah so which would have made sense you had to protect there were a few battles like Franklin yeah Devil's Den Right. They were very, yeah. very bloody hand-to-hand hand hand combat. Sure. Yeah, very yeah. bloody. But they were rare, and, and and even the soldiers recognized that it was considered brutal, Spotsylvania yeah. and those. Well, guys, thanks so much for You're taking your time. If there's anything y'all think, anything you think of that, that maybe we had not that y'all want to talk about, we hadn't asked. Are you guys staying here overnight? We'll stay here overnight, yes, ma'am. And so the really smart guy will be here. Yeah, he'll be here tomorrow on the clothing. And then and really, if you get a chance to talk with Caleb, hope he's here, I'll point him out to you. But he's uh, uh, he's uh he's got a good yeah. knowledge and actually makes a lot of uniforms. So he, he's... What is his job now? He's a banker. Yeah, that's an amazing thing about reenacting guys. You think there's just a lot of people... Oh, with, yeah, doctors, we got doctors, yeah, lawyers, yeah. professional people that love history. Uh, live a daily life just like everybody else, and it's an opportunity. I mean, you develop friendships that'll last an eternity. Uh, you know, so uh, we're all a family. Sure, all, sure. Even when, yeah, even yeah. I mean, it'll surprise you. It'll surprise you the folks that's out here. So we're yeah. checking on each other. Um, oh yeah. We're at each other's weddings. No, oh, sure. You, yeah. you develop you develop a friendship, and it's 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 a neat yeah. hobby. I mean, it really is. I guess a lot of you probably metal detect, or at least some of you. Some of us have. Yeah. Some of us have. We we've we've worked at it a little bit. <laughs> I understand, guys. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Mark. We're gonna get a rare look at a saber bayonet, just like the pummel for the saber bayonet that I found. We're gonna take a closer look at it. And this is an infield saber bayonet. And that's the part that we found on the video. And I'm gonna put a description or a link in the description and above right there where you, if you hadn't seen that video yet, you can see that part. You can see the curvature right there. And it hooked, it, it pressed in the button here and it has a little groove right there. It goes in a channel. Can you show everybody how that would have hooked in? Just take, press the button, he's up, come off, and go back on. Into that. There's a little notch that goes right on the side of the barrel. Slide down, and it locks. I wish I could have found the rest of it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy with that part. Thanks for showing us that. Can we take a look at your, your scabbard for it too? Oh, yes sir. And then we found a piece that we thought was that piece as well. Uh, we're gonna take a closer look at it. And look right there, cause it's got that almost heart-shaped top. And we're going to take a look at the piece that I think Kevin found, and that may relate to the other part of it. Thanks a lot. We appreciate that. It, that's an 1860. 1860. Now, is that original? It's original. Oh, wow. I found this in a pawn shop. Wow. The date is is worn off the actual date but this is a 1960 uh officer's dress sword wow so guys this is this is an original this is not a reproduction that that's incredible <laughs> never know what you'll find in a pawn shop no you don't and i tell you 
that's uh, that's dedication. A lot of people have reproduction stuff, but there are a lot of stuff that that some of the more serious uh, reenactors have that's actually real. So, is that your only real piece, or do you have more real? Pieces? No, this is the only actual real piece that I have. Okay. And a lot of people say, "Why are you carrying that out?" Well, so you can see it, and everybody else can see it. That's right. Why not share it? Let everybody enjoy it. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You that's, that's really amazing. Check out the boots too. Which is it's it's a surprise.